Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We recently voted on a, on a budget. We committed together uh, to a, what we recognize as a stretch budget. But basically we said, God being our helper, we want to do this. We want to tackle this. We want to embrace this budget challenge. I think we told you at the time that if each family made up, makes up this congregation would give $10 a week more, that would cover, more than cover, the, the total increase in the budget. Now, we realize that not every family can do that. And so we're trusting God that those who can't will be balanced out by those who can. And I would think that perhaps this is a time for some to begin to give. Maybe, maybe you weren't taught that. When, when Karen and I were growing up in our respective homes, we were, we were taught that giving was just a matter of fact. You, you, you gave when you went to church on Sunday. I think I've told you before, I, I began having jobs when I was, I was a little fella. Uh, we had a little push lawnmower, and I would drag it around to neighbors, and they would pity me and let me mow their yard and uh, pay me a little something for that. And... I'd come back home, and Mama would say, now, how much did they pay you? Now, it never even dawned on me that I would say, well, none of your business. I was, well, they gave me this much. And she said, okay. And she would normally make change for me, and she said, now, this is 10%. This goes into the offering. And that's how I was raised. So giving has never, it's, it's never been a discussion I mean, in, our, in our family. Karen and I, these were givens that when Karen and I were married, we're just built into who we are, how we would operate, how we would live. But that's not true of everybody. I realize that. And so what I, what I don't want to do is, is superimpose or assume that my upbringing on this is yours or that, or that you were taught to have the commitment and convictions that, that Karen and I were taught. And so I think it's good from time to time to stop and let's talk about what the Scripture says about this wonderful subject. That I'm preaching today, how, sh how should we then... Give, and I'll give you a background to that with apologies to Francis Schaeffer, who wrote the great book, How Should We Then Live? 2 Corinthians 9, 1 to 15 is what I'm reading from today. And so if you have that in your Bibles, and uh, I much prefer you looking at your Bible. If, if you don't have a Bible, it's going to be on the screens for you. Let's stand together. Follow along as I read this passage. Sometime today you will want to read 2 Corinthians 8, the passage leading up to this. Uh, Paul says to the church at Corinth, Now it's superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I'm sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised, so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an ex exaction. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. We just read that in Psalm, remember. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. 
by their approval of this service. They will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. If you'll notice, the gospel is tied to giving in this passage. Thank you. Be seated. Francis Schaeffer, in the 1970s, 1976 to be exact, published a book, How Should We Then Live? It was followed up in 1977 by a 10-part video series, some of you may have seen this, of the same title. And he is credited in this book and in the, in the following video series to have given breath and impetus and energy to what would become the rise of conservative evangelicalism around the world, but particularly in the West and particularly in this country. In fact, it has been observed that the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973 found many Christians asleep at the wheel, but in 1976 when Francis Schaeffer's book came out, it was the rallying call, it was the clarion call, and it, it gave the necessary urgency and impetus to what we know as the pro-life movement today. In other words, it was a, it was a ground breaker, a ground shaker. So if you haven't read How, Shall, How Should We Then Live, I would encourage you to, to do that. And the video series is readily available uh, today as well. With a little bit of a twist on what he said, this passage, it seems to me, answers the question, how should we then give? Now, when you talk about stewardship, you're talking about all of life. We are stewards of the life God has given us. And all we have to do is practice that little thing that I've done with our children many times is to inhale and exhale and realize that that came from God. Without God's blessing, without God's grace, without God's permission, you can't just inhale. And if you can't inhale, you're not likely to have any exhaling going on. The very breath we have comes from him. And so we are stewards of the life he has given us. We are stewards of the, of the time. Every one of us has the same 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's nobody has more, nobody has less. We're stewards of that time. How we use it. That's why, one of the reasons that on the Lord's Day we gather here. You could be many other places. You could, you could actually go... Uh, on Sermon Audio and hear this sermon later on. Uh, you could hear a lot better sermons on Sermon Audio than mine. In other words, you could be somewhere else listening, but it's the, it's the time. We take our time as stewards of all that God's given us and we gather. Our talents, we're stewards of that. God has, God has gifted every one of you in different ways. Some, some of the gifts overlap. But every one of you is gifted. If you belong to Jesus Christ and he is your Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit in giving you the new birth also gave you or stirred you or cultivated in you the gifts that God intends for you to manifest. And we are stewards of that. Of our giving, of our possessions. We're stewards of that as well. I think it's in the treasure principle. It says, God does not increase our income so that we might in increase our standard of living, but he increases our income so that we might increase our standard of giving. I think isn't that I think is what it says. Our standard of giving. And we'll give account one day for what God has given us and how we have used it. Our children are, are gifts from God. We're stewards of them. We don't realize that when they're little bitty babies and, and we're spending our time feeding them and changing them and rocking them. But as they grow up and they, they move toward maturity and they move toward embarking on their own, you realize my primary 
influence of pouring into that child is over. And we'll give account to God for how we raised and taught and nurtured his gifts of children. So let's think for a few minutes today on this passage. The, we're going to look at the 15 verses and I want to try to tackle them under six headings if you look at these. When, to answer the question, how should we then give, first of all, so that reminders are not necessary. So that reminders to give are not necessary. Secondly, so as to acknowledge the principle of sowing and reaping. Third, so as to express a heart for the principle of sowing and reaping. Not only to acknowledge it, but to, but to have a heart about it. Fourth, so as to express belief in God's ability to bless. And then so as to express a sincere concern for the ministry. Number five. And this, when he talks about the ministry in this passage, you're going to see he's talking about the, the collection for the saints. Six, so as to demonstrate gratitude for the gift of Jesus Christ. And that great final verse in this passage. Thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. In other words, we, we can extol the virtues of Jesus, but we really don't have the vocabulary to express the depth of the gratitude unto God for sending Jesus Christ. So let's look at this for a few minutes. First of all, we should give so that reminders are not necessary. Look at verses 1 to 5. Very interesting what he says here. He says, it's superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry of the saints. But he does it. But you know, let me say something about, about this congregation. And I know this was true before I got here, but, but in the nine plus years I've been here, I've been amazed at the generosity of this congregation when it comes to, to meeting a need. I, we could go back time and time again where we, where we said there is this need and the church has risen up here and met the need. Uh, that's, that's a good reputation to have. When we were doing our evaluations this past summer in our Acts 1-8 uh, church growth workshop, time and time again what came up was, was Bethel's history and legacy of being generous. You say, well, Pastor, if that's true, why are you taking time to preach on this? Because of the very reason that, that Paul did to the Corinthians. He starts out saying, it's superficial for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints because of their track record, even as a young church. Isn't it fascinating, however, all the problems that Corinth had, all the way from fighting over whose who's preacher, who was their favorite preacher, all the way to the end where they're fighting over the resurrection and all those things in between for all the challenges and the problems Paul could say to this church your giving has a reputation among the churches in Macedonia so he says here it's superfluous for me to, to write about this ministry for the saints that's, how, that's his term for, for this collection taking up uh, the offering for that for I know your readiness, of which I boast about you, the people of Macedonia. He said, I, I tell them when I'm, when I'm there. Boy, the church at Corinth has got this right. Saying that Achaia, and that's the province that Corinth was in, has been ready since last year. In other words, you, you're so excited about giving that you've, you've already made preparations a year ago. Your zeal has stirred up most of them. When I tell them about that, then, then they're provoked to say, well, we... We shouldn't lag behind in that. But I'm sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter. In other words, Paul acknowledges on the one hand, it's, it's superfluous for me to write to you about this, but, but it's also needful to provoke you in this so that, so that you don't get into a rut and then begin to lag behind. So I'm sending the brothers. So that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me, in other words, if they come later from, the, from these churches in Macedonia and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated. They'd say, Paul, you, you told us this congregation was a, was a really big-hearted congregation. Well, they are for the most part. He said, I, I don't want to be humiliated in my bragging on you. Not to say, to say nothing of you. He said, you would be, should be humiliated too. 
for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. In other words, it's not, not as extortion. And we've come here almost, almost like Roman soldiers to, to take from you some tax. So it shouldn't happen that way. Now parents, are you raising your children that way? So that when they're grown adults, they won't need to be reminded, even if you do find it wisdom to remind them from time to time of that which they already know. We need to be sure we're doing a good job of that. We're only one generation away from losing many things that are, we were given when we were growing up. The second thing I want you to see is that we, we should give so as to acknowledge the principle of sowing and reaping. So the point is this, here's, here's what I want, Paul says, here's what I want you to bullseye in on. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. It's the, it's the principle of sowing and reaping. It's talked about in the Old Testament. It's brought up in the New Testament. It's from the agrarian culture. If you want a field of ryegrass, I've told you about my friend Billy Andrews, who I would, I would watch him sometimes as he would go in and, and, and plow up the big, the big fields that he was growing ryegrass, and then would come in with the ryegrass on his tractor and just scatter it promiscuously. Now, now if he had come up with a few ryegrass seeds, planted them in the middle of the field and said, I sure hope this takes hold. <laughs> I sure hope this, this ryegrass just spreads to every corner of the field. It's a vain hope. If he was sowing sparingly, he would reap sparingly. But he sowed bountifully. He would sow as, as his tractor went and tried to make those turns near the, near the fence corners and the ryegrass would spread beyond the fence corners. So that when the ryegrass came up, you'd actually have some growing outside the fence. He, he sowed bountifully and would reap bountifully. You understand that? That's the principle in life, but it's the principle in giving. It is finally the question of who do you want to manage this money? Do you want to manage it or do you want God to manage it? I said, well, I want God to manage it. Well, then show him that you do. Give. Give is a reminder that it's, we didn't originate any of this. It's all derived from the goodness of God. You say, well, I earn that by the sweat of my brow. Well, who has enabled you to work hard enough to sweat? God. So the principle is there, and, that, and this principle is woven into everything else that he's talking about here. Because he comes up in, in the third place in verse 7, we're, we're to give so as to express a heart for the principle of sowing and reaping. Each one must give, so there's a there's a necessity, there's a, if I can use it, an obligation placed upon each follower of Jesus Christ. Each one must give, but here's the measure, the standard, as he has decided in his heart, as he's purposed in his heart. In other words, it would be silly for me to say, well, we give X percent, so you ought to give X percent or more. That's, we do what's perp what God's stirred in our hearts. And this is more challenging, I believe, by the way, than say I'm giving a tithe. A tithe is 10%. Do the simple math. Knock off a zero at the end and that's what we're... This is much more challenging than that. As he's purposed in his heart. Paul says in another place in Corinthians, give according as God has blessed you. Give in response to how God has blessed you. You see, that's why I think it's important to have a heart to heart conversation about this. The challenge we've given one another to increase giving is not uh, anything carnal about it. It, just, it stretches us so that in attempting to give more, well that, that may mean, by the way, uh, that some in here will begin to give $40 a month. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to jump on you about any of that, but it's, the challenge is to stretch and to reach to to prove that I don't, I know that this is not mine. 
it's God's. And I've been challenged to give in this ministry to the saints. I've been challenged to give. So you're to give as you decide in your heart. That's the first thing. Not reluctantly. In other words, okay. All right, I've got to write this check so they'll shut up about this. No, not that. In fact, that person, a person with that attitude shouldn't give until <laughs> they get their heart right. Or under compulsion, a friend of mine where I pastored years and years ago in Louisiana, a uh, long time ago, ran a, a, little, a loan company in town. And he told me about certain churches, and I want to be very careful here, that would essentially tax or pressure their members into, into committing a certain amount of money that they would give to the work of the ministry, to the treasury of the church for the year. And he said he would have, he would have uh, little old ladies come in sometime to borrow money to meet their pledge. Not under compulsion. This is this is a, an, what we call a blessed obligation, a precious responsibility. So you don't give angrily, or because you're under under force to do so. For God loves a cheerful giver. You heard me talk about this before. The word cheerful in the Greek is hilaron. You hear in that the word hilarious. It's really a good checkup. And it, when we sit down to write tithe or put it in an envelope, do you get a giggle? Do you get a sanctified giggle? God loves that. A hilaron, a hilarious giver. A privilege. As David said one time, Lord, who are we, who are we, that you would let us give to this noble cause of building the temple? Because David knew God had a thousand ways he could put together the proceeds for that. Well, the fourth four thing I want you to see, we're to give so as to express belief in God's ability to bless. So there's this. There's this acknowledgement of the principle of sowing and reaping. There's a, there's a heart commitment to that principle. What drives it all is God's ability to bless. The turning loose of funds, of, of, of possessions, for the work of the ministry. Sure is to be done out of, out of that, that responsible that precious responsibility, that, that joyful obligation. But it's with a confidence. As we hear people say, you cannot outgive God. And that's true. You cannot outgive God. In fact, the truth of the matter is we could never give enough to even, even meet and match what God has given to us. So it's not about that. It's not about paying off some, some grace debt. It's this. Verse 8, God is able, now watch the language here, to make all grace abound to you. All kinds, all facets of grace. Not just sustain you, but abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times. That's pretty comprehensive. Always sufficient in all areas, all the time. You may abound in every good work. That confidence that comes from seeing the blessing of God in your life. That confidence that comes from saying what a privilege it is to give back, to give to the treasury of the church, to give to the work of the ministry. For the very many reasons that we cited earlier. And excited to see, okay, now how's God going to bless us? How's God going to bless us? How's God going to stretch us? How's he going to provide for us? And in verse 9, as it is written, and, in, and Paul is taking this part of Psalm 112, 
He has, a, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He is speaking about the Lord there, about God. He says, that's the God I'm talking about. You can trust this God. And here's further, Paul says, he who supplies seed to the sower. Whoop. Don't think that you got that seed on your own. You say, well, but, you know, I, I take these certain kind of plants and they, they sprout a seed at the end of, of their growing time and I take those seeds to use them for next year. True. Where'd you get those plants? Well, they came from seeds that, okay, true. Where'd, and you keep walking it back and say, well, I, uh, somebody, I, I found, I got a plant. I mean, I had nothing to do with it having any seed in it. Exactly. He who provides seed to the sower and bread for food will supply, it's the first promise, and multiply. God's not interested in addition. He's in multiplication for his people. Multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now he's, he's taken that analogy, sowing seed, so that grain comes up and is harvested for the use of animals and humans and bartering. He says in the same way, and remember he's talking about the ministry to the saints, he's talking about the giving, this, this offering that he's collecting, that he's coming for. That they should have the confidence, give with the confidence that God who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. The fruit that we have is a growing in grace. Do you know that? Do you know that one of the ways we grow in grace is to develop a good, responsible habit of giving to the work of the ministry? It matures us. He goes on further and says, verse 11, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. He said, here's the, here's the cycle. You give faithfully. God enriches. You're enriched so that you can be, be generous in every way. You can bless others. And there's a cycle that goes on there. And some people rob themselves of that cycle because they, they let the devil lie to them and tell them what they can't do, tell them how foolish it would be to in other words, since you can't, here's, here's the argument. Since you can't give at this level, then don't give at all. That's a devil's lie. Because as you start practicing giving a little, then God makes it possible for you to give more and more. And that ought to be really the challenge of the people of God is how can we stretch? How can we do more this year than we did last year? Like the Lottie Moon mission offer. We're not paying Lottie Moon off. We're not going to come to a time where we get the note that says, she's covered, no more. No. That's a stretch. It's a stretch. Because we want to put more missionaries on the field. Reach more of the unreached people groups. Then number, number five is, so as to express a sincere concern for the ministry. To realize that you value the ministry. This ministry of service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. He says there's a climate that happens here. You, you take care of this responsibility, and the saints rejoice and, and, and give thanks, but you also have the heart of gratitude implanted in you. Four, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission as being obedient to the Lord that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ. He says, because you're Christ's followers. You've been saved by grace through faith. You understand grace, freely given, did not, did not deserve it, yet have received an abundance of it. That that gospel compels you to give. That gospel stirs you up to consider doing things that in your unconverted state you would have never considered doing. But as a follower of Christ, growing in his grace, you see this as an opportunity, one of the ways you confess the gospel, that's what he says here. And the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. Here, here it is, the gospel makes generous people. 
not just in giving to the offering, but in giving yourselves, giving your lives, touching the lives of others. The gospel makes generous people. You show me a stingy Christian, I'll show you a person who's a contradiction in terms. And is it best an infant, spiritually, and needs to be grown and nurtured and taught? And is it worst, a fraud? Verse 14, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. When I read this again this past week, you know what hit me? There's a group of people in Haiti who've never met most of you. And I promise you, they're praying for you. They're praying for us. They give thanks to God. Their, their little place of meeting, their little ramshackle place of meeting was burnt to the ground. And so they began to meet under a tree. Which is great if the weather's okay. It's not raining. And this congregation comes along and says, we want, to, we want to join with you. We want to partner with you in mission and ministry. And the Lord opens up the opportunity. And you give generously and, and confidently. And we're able to secure that, that facility for them that is now there, the mailing address of the, of the church at Deja. I read this and I thought, that's exactly what's going on here. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you that, that has flowed out of us to bless them. And we could do that over and over again with other matters. We need to wrap it up though. How should we then give? In the sixth place, so as to demonstrate gratitude for the gift of Jesus Christ. Paul ends this by saying, as he's, he's talking about gift. Your gift and being gifted and grace of God. And it's on and on talking about gift and it just, the Spirit just prompts him and says, wait. The, the, the greatest gift is Jesus Christ. The gift of Jesus Christ to us, taking us from darkness to light, from death to life, out of bondage and sorrow and night, from being enemies and aliens, to being sons and daughters of the living God, to being adopted into the family of God, the gift of Jesus Christ is, is inexpressible. And so, so one of the ways, Paul says, you express your gratitude to God is you, you give. Because Jesus is the gift. He's the gift. Hmm. So, how should we then give with the knowledge that being saved by grace carries with it the responsibility to cultivate a set of spiritual disciplines among those the grace of giving we got to know that perhaps you've not had a habit of that in your life that's okay nobody's going to chastise you about that But if you want to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, then this will become a part of your life. So I don't know how I can. We'll just start wherever. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, says the Lord. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you so abundant you cannot receive. Folks, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about sowing seed faith in terms of, of dollar amounts and then watching all the money come back. That's, that's a devil's lie. What I am talking about though is a biblical principle of sowing and reaping. And see, the danger is if it's, if it's easy to justify and to talk ourselves into not turning loose of our money when it comes to giving to the work of the Lord, then it's easier and easier to justify in our minds other things that are spiritual disciplines that the Lord has called us to engage in if we're to grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ to be conformed to the image of His Son. And in that regard, giving is easy. Giving money is easy. Writing a check is easy. In fact, it's one of those things in the Christian life that you can get into the rut of and never consider, is this the year we give more? Look at what God, how God has blessed us. How does he start our hearts? And that's how we ought to give. It's a blessing. 
It's a privilege because you put yourself in a position to see God provide when you weren't quite sure where the provision would come from. If you've been faithful giving throughout your Christian pilgrimage, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And God always shows himself to be Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Let's trust God in this wonderful grace of giving. Let's join together as family units. Say, under God, we're going to be used by God to help reach and exceed this challenge budget that's been given to us that we all voted on and said, yes, that's our budget. That was just step one. So I want to challenge you. Prayerfully consider your part in this. If you're giving already way above and beyond, bless your heart. Thank you for your example. May the Lord add many to your, uh, to your type. But if you're not, then think about it. Pray about it. And do I really want to say to God, I thought, I really thought I could handle this, all this better than you could, God. Lord, I, I know, I know that you're gracious and all, but I just wanted, I had to, I had to just be sure, just in case you're not. We don't want to have that conversation with our God. We want to maintain, thank God for this, and grow on and build on the reputation, Bethel, those folks. You can always count on them to give. What a, re a great reputation to have. Let's pray together.